Thank you for the introduction. I need to say right at the beginning that despite the plea of my colleagues that I refused to allow us to have any subtitles this evening. <laughs> I have discovered that one of the differences between people from Scotland and people from Canada is that people in Canada have accents. <laughs> and if you wonder why there's a misspelling on the slide behind me up there, it's because that's the way we say it in Glasgow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've pointed it out to you now. You can see <laughs> just goes to show. I begin with a story. I, I remember standing in a hall, perhaps like this, and peering into the darkness. But this darkness was filled with sound and sometimes explosions of light. The sound was the, the hardcore dance music. And the lights were provided by high-tech lights in the ceiling responding to the music, the beat of which was physical. And the lights were scanning the room and rotating in a whole variety of ways. And I stared into the darkness. And in the darkness when I could see, because it's quite difficult for your vision when it moves to dark to light all the time, I could see some young people dancing in the middle of the floor, on the dance floor. Most of them were dancing in, in groups. Sometimes I danced with them, but not tonight. It was busy. And so I stood and I stared into the darkness. And it was important to stare into the darkness because although when people entered this hall, they were searched, their bags were checked, and they had to go through metal detectors, fights could break out. And while we discovered that at the back door and out in the street, the women in the team were much better at de-escalating violence, in the hall, well, I was quite a big guy. And some of us had to take responsibility. And so I stared into the darkness. This was probably the late 1990s, can't place it exactly, but about 20 years ago. The location was Kirkintilloch Baptist Church. The event, a dance cafe. It happened once a month, and it was a desperate attempt by a church which had a hugely strong youth work we could have 80 young people at our youth fellowship on a Sunday evening, but a desperate attempt to reach out to a subculture of young people with whom we had no contact whatsoever. And so there I was on a Saturday night staring into the darkness. I glanced at my watch. It was just before 11 o'clock. I probably sighed another half hour to go and then probably at least another hour and a half to tidy up because the next day in that hall would be Sunday school. And the next day, as I think I was a youth minister then, I was probably responsible for the Sunday school because we needed to give the leaders a break, most of whom were among the 30 other volunteers who were spread all over the church building that night on everything from the toilets to the door to the car park outside. I glanced again at my watch. It was 11 o'clock. I reached into my t-shirt, because if you're going to dance, you have to be dressed appropriately. I reached into my t-shirt and, and pulled out from it the glow stick that was hanging around my neck. I took the little plastic cross and I broke it, which mixes the chemicals so that it lights up. And I looked around the room. I'm sure I smiled. I don't often. 
And as I looked around the room, I saw all over that room suddenly where all the different volunteers were, because round their necks and on their wrists, and some of them tied onto their boots, the little crosses that we'd all agreed that we would break at the same time lit up. It might seem nothing to you, but you had to be at that event. For us, it was a holy moment in a strange place. For us, it was deeply symbolic. For we refused. We refused to allow that group to grow up without ever ever having met someone who loved Jesus and believed that maybe Jesus loved them. I tell you that story for two reasons. First of all, I'm an academic. I became an academic, I think, because an older minister said to me, Stuart, you have ability. Learn for us. And therefore, I became an accidental academic. I just kept going. But although I'm an academic, I so fundamentally reject the idea that it's the opposite of practitioner. This has so not been true in my body. At that time, when I was in that church, I was teaching systematic theology at an advanced level at the Scottish Baptist College, the doctrine of the Trinity, Anna, eschatology, indeed the person and the work of Christ. It was the same person who stood on that dance floor as taught in the classes. It is such a mistake we make when we separate academic rigor from practice. And for me, one of the great strengths of the institution that I'm now pleased to represent is that one of its commitments is to bring these two things together. And that is fundamentally essential. So you can call me a practitioner or you cannot call me an academic. I don't mind. I think I'm both. And I think both are necessary. I also tell you that story for another reason. I hope it irritates you slightly. If not, I'll make it worse. We took alcohol off them at the back door and we gave them it back when they left. It wasn't our job to confiscate it. We refused to let the police in one night because they didn't have a warrant and we weren't prepared to damage our relationship with the young people who were in the hall. My... uh, PA was nearly arrested that night as she was on the door and she was the one who refused to let them in. I could tell you more. I hope it irritates you. I hope it annoys you slightly. Because I think back, this was 20 years ago. I find it almost incredible to believe it was 20 years ago. I find it very difficult to believe that 20 years ago there were people with that kind of creativity and who are willing to leave the normal areas of their life and put themselves in a situation which sometimes involved risk. And you know what I find even more impressive? That I must have had a leadership that had the confidence that let us do it. But I hope the story irritates you a little. I hope it is raising for you questions, but should you? And should we? And haven't you crossed too many boundaries? Oh, I hope we crossed far too many boundaries. Because I want to push. I want to push you. I want to push hard. And I expect you, if you wish, to push me back. Because if you stand on a dance floor, or if you stand on a floor to speak, one needs to expect that that will be the case. And I want to push you because I think this topic of evangelism is so absolutely critical. Not because evangelism is important. I'm finding this hard. But because these kids who danced on that floor 
were important. And if we grow up surrounded by people, cultures and subcultures, who never have a positive encounter with the Christian faith, do not blame your government, liberal or conservative. Do not blame your education system. And do not blame their parents. Blame the church, for only the church has the commission to take the message of Jesus Christ to people. For many children, they have no parent who could share the faith. So I want to push you, because it really does matter. Why the choice of title? Has this changed? Yes. A different story. Perhaps a happier one. Perhaps one more easily to engage with. Where we lived in, in Kirk and Tillich, opposite us, there was a, a playing field. And over the years, I've discovered that my wife, Suzanne, and I seem to have an addiction of adopting rescue street dogs. And every single one of them has brought its own personality into our house. None quite like the one we have now. But because of this, it was good. We could take old Max, it was. He made it to the Netherlands with us, but no further. Old Max, we used to take across to the, the playing field. And the beauty of the playing field was that you would walk into it high up, and then there was a hill down, and then there was a soccer field below. And Max didn't have many skills, but he would bring back a ball. It was the easiest way in the world to exercise him. So you got a ball and one of these things that you could throw and you threw it. And it traveled forever. And Max followed it. And he picked it up and he brought it back. And once you'd done that 30 times, he was ready to go back. He hadn't moved. It was a great way to walk a dog. <laughs> the only problem was if there was anyone on the playing field who had a ball, this created a different difficulty because he brought it back. On this particular occasion, however, I went along and there were, there were uh, two children. I, I think they'd be aged maybe between nine and 10 years of age. And they had kites. And the kites were lying behind them with this string. And the two of them stood there and they were on the soccer field and they began to run dragging these kites behind them. And, and before they began to run, you, they looked at one another. You could see them. This was building up to a big moment. And they ran with these kites behind them. And they, they got to the other end. Of course, the kites had just been dragged behind them. And they looked at one another, and they turned around, and they did it again. I was impressed by their enthusiasm and by their energy. Sometimes something very cruel happened, though. For as they pulled the kites, one of them hit like a lump in the ground. So it bounced up into the air. We have got it. You could, you could feel it. We have got it. We have done it. The kite's about to fly. And it went back down again on the ground, and they ran across to the other side. They were young. So they turned around and they did it again. These kites were never going to fly because they did not know how. And actually, there was no wind. And for me, it very quickly became a parable of what I was experiencing in British church life. Because people, including me, and the church I was part in, were putting huge amounts of energy into evangelism and into mission. We were having conferences. We were having speakers. We were having lectures. Lo and behold, like this very event that we are having here. To be sure, some people were doing it because of the great commission of Jesus. Matthew 28 and 19 and following. But the energy undoubtedly was being created in part 
by the fact that increasingly some people at least were becoming aware of huge numerical decline in our churches and the loss of the cultural significance of Christianity in the land. And this created an urgency that birthed an energy and there was energy and there was enthusiasm. We were seeker friendly and purpose driven. We emerged the more alternative. We'd had some fresh expressions and we did some messy church. We were constantly engaged in promoting and advocating programs which were not programs because we don't need any more programs as we sought to address the decline. Moments of success like a kite bouncing over a lump of earth were triumphed in evangelical rhetoric as good news stories. But no one asked the question of how long did these good news stories last. No one asked the question of what actually do we mean by success. No one asked the question of what do we actually mean by church. And people were not very honest at times about how transferable one practice from one context was into another. But boy, there was enthusiasm and energy. Don't get me wrong. There are most certainly congregations and programs such as Alpha, which in some contexts and among some people were seeing people want to faith in Jesus Christ. But for all the frantic activity, I am not sure that we knew what we were doing or that there was any wind. The 2016 Scottish Annual Church Attendance Census, which was just published last year, the Easter 2017, with huge irony in it, showed that 390,000 people regularly attended church in Scotland. That is 7.2% of the Scottish population. This percentage was down from 17% in 1984. Now let me rewind, because this is critical. This period of decline has taken place in the era of frantic, evangelistic, and missional energy. And I say that because there is a suggestion that in the UK we are 20 years ahead in terms of decline than you are here in Canada. And I hear and I feel a missional concern and I see the frantic energy beginning to emerge in some places. But we need to think toughly. And we need to think very critically, not simply of the old that we may want to dismiss or not, but we also need to think very critically of the new and as to what extent it is in fact addressing the fundamental questions which in our hearts we sense are troubling us. It bothers me sometimes when we judge old practices by a criteria that we do not apply to new practices. I find it strange in some contexts why a small church of 30 people can be considered a failure because it's old, and a new church of 20 people can be considered success because it's new. This is such weak thinking. And it does not help us find our way forward into the future. So I'm going to offer you three perspectives. That's all they are. I often tell people that I am opinionated. It doesn't make me right. It just means I have opinions. It would be wrong for me, though, to say they don't matter to me, because they do. So they're probably which in my Baptist theology talk makes them convictions. I think they're true, but it still doesn't make me right. 
Whether they are valuable to you or not is not actually my job. For the job of whether or not they are valuable will be whether they resonate and connect in your context. And we need to grasp the importance that evangelism and mission is deeply contextual. And so last night we can rightly appreciate the stories from French-speaking Canada, but they do not guarantee a transferability into English-speaking Canada, not simply because of the difference of language, but perhaps because of the different socio-religious contexts in which the evangelism is taking place in our different contexts. We need to recognize that. To be slightly provocative about it, to promote the story of Jesus on a message of justification through faith by grace alone, to promote it in that sense, I'm not denying it is that, that's not what I'm saying. Listen, to promote the story of Jesus on the basis of justification through faith works in 16th century Europe where the background was law. But how does it resonate with someone whose context is freedom? Contextually, the gospel has to meet the people who we are seeking to bring it to. And I won't make the argument that this is what we find in the Bible itself, but I think that that is true. So let me offer these. I'm keeping you awake anyway. Good. We'll keep going. So the first of my kind of convictions or perspectives. We need to put second things second. Over the years in a variety of literature, I have noticed a competition taking place or a debate going on. And the debate is, as we seek to engage today as churches in our culture, what should our standpoint be? How should we look at it? And there are three contenders to be first. It's got to be one of these, according to the literature. So this is how it goes. The first standpoint was the church or ecclesiology. In a context and culture where people attended church and the Christian faith could claim almost de facto to have a recognized social significance, let us call that Christendom for the sake of argument. In such a context, the starting point was and could be the church. What do we in the church do? People came. They came. So what do we in the church do? And so what we did as a church really mattered. Our programs mattered. Our pastoral care mattered. Our Sunday public worship services were of central significance. Insofar as there was outreach, it was often outreach to get them to come to us rather than the other flavor. The attractional model was build it big enough, interesting enough, faster than the others, and they will come. Over time, however, it became clear. No matter how we built it, they weren't coming. Or at least not in the numbers they once did. Or at least those who were attending were often the same old faces. Some began to suggest, dare to suggest, that the church in the West, or the global North, to include us all, was sick. Some said dying, although many were still in denial. Those, however, who saw that there was something wrong with the situation, and I, I think they were being prophetic, said that things had fundamentally began to change. We needed another standpoint to engage with society. We could no longer start from thinking and putting all our energy into church. We needed a new place, a new perspective by which to engage with society. Mission, they said. The standpoint for engaging is mission, not overseas mission, but mission as a home activity. In the literature, in a many an essay, people began to talk about missio dei, 
They were expected to put it in. If they did not, they were marked down. The point had to be made that the mission of God was the starting point. The church did not exist for itself, but rather the church was brought into existence through God's mission in the world for the purpose of participating with God in the world. I hope you've read some of this because it's important. Emil Brunner's well-known observation, the church exists for mission as a fire exists for burning, appeared time and time again. He continued, where there is no mission, there is no church. The term missional, strange word, emerged, becoming the phrase to define this new movement, missional church. Missional captured this idea of a shift in paradigm from thinking church to thinking mission and participating in mission. So is that in their well-known book, Michael Frost and Alan Hirsch, the book, you could have chosen many of them, but the book, The Shaping of Things to Come, they put it like this. Don't think church, think mission. But just as it seemed that mission had gained an unassailable place, just as it seemed that arguments had been won, another contender appeared. Discipleship. We're not stressing discipleship enough. It's not enough to talk about church, but nor is it enough to talk about mission. Our goal has not to be mission, but discipleship. And of course, disciples make disciples. And so Mike Breen, in a very popular book called Building a Discipleship Culture, said, we don't have a missional problem. We have a discipleship problem. Discipleship should be the perspective by which we look at everything we are meant to make disciples. Okay. So, in a short period of time, or it seemed like that, it was the church first and the others followed. And then it was mission and the others followed. And then it was discipleship. It's not over yet. In 2017, the British practical theologian Pete Ward introduces his recent book by saying, that a major, that a head of a major mission agency had said to him, ecclesiology or the church is the new rock and roll. And so it goes on. In response to all of this, I would say this. There is absolutely no doubt that between these three there may be a need to emphasize one over and against the others. And I would take my stand between these three probably on mission. We most certainly need a different paradigm of thinking for engaging with the world. And I think if I was to give an analysis that that is one of the biggest shifts that need to change. People need to move from thinking church to thinking mission. So that's the first thing I would say in response to this competition to be top of the list. Secondly, however, the fact is all of these three things are deeply integrated with one another. And it's far too simplistic to pick one out, even as a prior. So we say we should be doing mission. Who's the we? Uh -uh. So straight away, we've got a difficulty. This we, who are not meant to be church, but are meant to be, who are they? Oh, yeah, well, it's just, these three are connected together, and it's far too simplistic thinking to think that we can pick one without attention to the other two. But if I have to choose one to be at the top of these three, I'm sticking with mission. Thirdly, I think none of them should be seen as primary. I don't think any of them should be seen as the starting point. I think the starting point is found in a more fundamental place. The starting point is found in a confession. And that confession is that Jesus is Lord. 
I don't think we have lost confidence in the gospel. I don't think we have lost confidence in evangelism. I think we have lost confidence in the very heart confession that we claim to hold, and that is that Jesus is Lord. In this respect, I agree with Frost and Hirsch in a book when they write, we believe that Christology is the key to the renewal of the church in every age and in every possible situation it might find itself. For the source and the end and the integrating factor of church mission and discipleship is none other than the presence and reality of Jesus Christ who we confess as Lord who calls on people to come and follow him. That is prior. Let me put it differently and perhaps a little bit more poetically. Our starting point is not so much a standpoint but rather our starting point is to be found as we dance on the quaking ground of the resurrection, declaring with the first preaching angels and the first preaching women and the first preaching church that Jesus Christ is alive. That is the starting point. That's good preaching. But what does it look like in practice? I think it starts to look like in practice when as congregations we take the time to talk, to listen, and to actually believe that Jesus might speak to us. I see so much energy expended on other things. So much time expending on other things. But people won't take the time to stop, to listen, and to believe that the risen Christ is in the room. And he cares. I actually don't think he cares about the color of the paint. I don't think he cares about the new kitchen. But I think he cares. I think he cares about the mission of the church. And I think he cares about the mission of the church in our context. Why don't we do it? I suggest because we don't believe he will or he can. Or why don't we do it? The fundamental block is not found over here. The fundamental block is found in the heart. Jesus is alive. Jesus is Lord. And I dare to believe that when his people gather, he may well speak. But perhaps we don't know how. Several years ago, in the Baptist Union of Scotland, for many years in Scotland, that was my primary involvement. I was a minister in a Baptist church, of course, and then taught at the Scottish Baptist College. In these roles, I was involved in our national life. If there was a, a group, at national strategy level for either due to invitation or due to my position, I ended up on it. Strategy groups and ministry groups and ministerial groups and pioneer ministry groups. Oh, and I was on many a group. And at the end of, let me give you the exact date here. Yeah, leading up to 2010, we were having a bit of a crisis in our union. And there was a huge internal debate taking place. And the debate was this. Should we be concentrating on our identity? And here I'm talking Baptist because it's my story. You, you may not be listening as a Baptist or here as a Baptist, but it's my story in this. We were having a huge debate. Should we concentrate on our identity, who we were, who we are in Christ? But the huge clamor was we needed to be more missional. Remember, I'm talking way back 2006 here. Back then, we have lived some of this story you're living now, and we have not always made the right steps. And we were struggling. What should we do? In 2010, we had a very decisive annual gathering. 
The title of it was called Communities of Conviction. And something happened. God spoke. And together we dug into our past as to who we were. And we decided that instead of the new strap line that we were going to use to advertise ourselves, I mean, who's actually caring? Rather than the new strap line, we would make a confession. And so we took as our main title, Under the Rule of Christ. And from that perspective, we were then able to say, under the rule of Christ, we will be intentionally relational because he is our Lord. Under the rule of Christ, we'll be unashamedly missional because he is our Lord. Under the rule of Christ, we will be creatively rooted in our theology and in our past, bringing it into the present. Imagine with me an idea. We gather together in a room, and in the center is a table. And on that table is some food, and some bread, and wine, and a Bible. This is so not rocket science. We gather and we pray. We eat bread and we drink wine. And we talk. And we talk about matters that matter. Including, how does Jesus want us in this place to reach out to our neighbors? And we talk. And we talk believing two things. That the head of the church has an opinion. And secondly, by his opinion, secondly, by his spirit, he may well give it. But let's not do that. Instead, let's look for the latest program and the latest idea and let us drag those kites across the ground time and time again, expending our energy. But actually, I don't think we know what we're doing. And without his blessing, I suspect there is no wind. I leave it there. Second perspective. Oh, we need to deal with the E word. And up to this point, I've been dancing a little around it. But I realize I've used the word mission a lot, but that's not what I meant to talk about. I'm aware of that, Frank, I know. <laughs> it's not meant to be a mission in general. It's meant to be evangelism in particular. So, okay, let's nail it down, shall we? And to nail it down, I'm going to use, hopefully it's a quotation by Bosch that's behind me. Yeah? Good. Keep me right. I'm not going to look back. I just, I sometimes see the reflection in Harry's glasses. <laughs> and that's how I know that it's moved, yeah. I'm going to read it. Let me read this. I think this is important. Mission includes evangelism as one of its essential dimensions. Evangelism is a proclamation of salvation in Christ to those who don't, do not believe in him, calling them to repentance and conversion, announcing the forgiveness of sin, and inviting them to become members of Christ's earthly community to begin a life of service to others in the power of the Holy Spirit. So at least we now have a definition. Now, according to this understanding, mission is broader than evangelism, but evangelism is at the heart of mission. I need to say, and we're not going to discuss this just now, but you might want to come back on this. I am not convinced that discussions about whether social concern or evangelism should have priority or whether we need deeds or actions take us anywhere. For in my opinion, social care, the pursuit of justice and evangelism, and the exercise of words and deeds are necessarily all parts of what it means to be fully engaged in the mission of God. The rest of it is an academic exercise that does not lead to more mission or more evangelism. So I'm not sure we should spend our whole time in that. But we have to focus on evangelism. So, so let's push it down a little bit. And here with, as Bosch puts it, evangelism involves proclaim, it involves call, it involves announce, it involves invite. Another story. 
I am here tonight as a result of that kind of evangelism. I am. I must honor that past. To keep a long story short, when I was 11 years of age, I attended a children's holiday club in a small Nazarene church in my hometown of Uddingston near Glasgow. My immediate family were not church attenders, although my parents had sent all of the children to Sunday school, my two older sisters and I. Sunday school was in a local Baptist church. We were sent there because my auntie, my auntie Lizzie went there and she still had some power over my dad. By this time I was the only one attending, 11 I think, 11, in case you're wondering what that word is I'm saying, the number after 10 and before 12. <laughs> that was for Shana. At that age, I attended that little typical children's holiday club. My dad had died the previous months, cancer. Now I look back and I guess I must have been a bit of a hurting boy. I don't remember feeling that at the time. And later life, I realized that would probably have been true. Anyway, I went along to this club and on the Friday night, they had the children's evangelist who preached the gospel message, I'm sure, very much in terms of proclaim, call, announce, and invite. I'm sure he spoke about sin, the death of Jesus, the possibility of the forgiveness of sins, and eternal life. I guess he spoke about all these things. I can't really remember, to be honest, but I'm guessing it was that type of club. It was that type of message. I think I was probably converted but how do you know if you're converted if you don't have the language to explain it? Something had happened. And so several weeks later, I stayed behind in the Sunday school class, and I said to my Sunday school teacher, June Weeks, June, I think I want to be baptized. Oh, for one who had little knowledge, I clearly knew the correct response. The conversion is baptism. She talked with me. I have no doubt she gave me a prayer to pray. A prayer in which I would have confessed all of my 11 years of sin, declared my faith in Jesus, and asked him into my life. And so it began. And I tell you that story because I am the result of the sort of evangelism that Bosch speaks about. In turn, over the years, as a pastor, as a preacher, as a guest speaker, as someone who organized special youth events, special youth clubs, multimedia evangelistic events that toured the north of Scotland and the south of England, was happy to try and put together Bob's Dance Cafe. I delivered evangelistic addresses very much in the style of Bosch suggests. Proclaim and invite and call. Theologically, I agree with Bosch. I agree with him when he describes evangelism as an essential dimension of the total activity of the church. It is that important. He calls it an indispensable ministry. I agree with him. He writes in his book, it's not an optional extra, but a sacred duty. I agree with all of that. If you were to invite me to preach at a baptismal service, I would not bet against me inviting people to come forward and to be baptized then and there on the night. I would probably do that. Hear all of this. I am convinced by this, yet I am embarrassed by evangelism. I am suspicious of it. I struggle with it. This is the heart of our dilemma. That those of us who believe in it are suspicious of it. And I think there's good reasons to be suspicious of it. One reason is that there have been cringe-inducing examples of evangelism. Some of these are the historical 
colonizing missionary activities that today leave us ashamed. But my, we still do it. When the person leaves the waiter or waitress a Christian tract rather than giving them a tip and thinks they're serving Jesus, really, that is not my world. And I believe in evangelism. This is a dilemma. Perhaps the reason is that we may be wary of trying to do things. Anna was really helpful with this the other day when she spoke about violence. I think, indeed, at times I'm wary of evangelizing people because it seems a form of violence to the friendship, an infringement of a relationship, an imposition into the lives. I feel that. Another reason might simply be that we're no longer convinced that it works because it's been a while since we've seen it. And so we are suspicious that it's worth the effort. Another reason, Anna mentioned all these reasons the other night, the other day. Another reason, however, may be that we are suspicious of the theology that's often associated with it. And what do I mean by that? I mean that in some of our experience, evangelism is presented an understanding of Jesus and God that is not robust enough to sustain a person when they face the first real crises in their life. Gil Duick is a member of the Canadian Mennonite Brethren. In 2017, he successfully complete, completed and defended his PhD studies at the Vraya University in Amsterdam. He was looking at reasons why young adults leave the church. The particular focus was his own Mennonite brethren tradition. He argued that while theories of faith development may give some answers in his community, they needed theological answers. They didn't want to know what the social scientists said. They needed to understand it theologically, which was correct, I think, for his tradition. And he argued that one of the reasons that young adults were leaving was that the theology they were being nurtured in was simply inadequate or robust enough to enable them to make sense of life and God. When a friend died, when they got pregnant, or when their parents broke up, the theology they had been offered did not work. Sometimes evangelism, to borrow a phrase or a paraphrase from the great Baptist king preacher, sometimes evangelism offers a promissory note that quite simply cannot deliver. There are reasons, so many reasons, why those of us who believe in it feel uneasy about it. And that is a conversation we need to have. That is where we need to wrestle. If it is going to be a good word, inspirational talks that we should do more will not last beyond the hour after the talk. We need to deal with genuine concerns. Oh, my story if you were to ask me today, how would I describe what happened to me? I would describe it as follows. As an 11-year-old boy, I heard Jesus say, come follow me. And today when I wakened up as a 56-year-old man, I said, still I will follow. When a person comes to faith in Jesus at a new creation, there are many ways that we can describe it. There are many ways we can unpack it. There are many theological understandings of what goes on. I am not denying, do not hear me wrongly, I am not denying the theological terminology to explain conversion, such as repentance, of forgiveness, salvation, reconciliation, new birth, death to life, eternal life, justification, sanctification. I get all of this. I also understand the whole range of different views of the death of Jesus that we feel as though we have to bring in on every occasion. 
But we need to separate the theological richness of describing what happens from the question of what does it mean to speak this into this culture and to people with authenticity and integrity. And, and so in preparation for this, the best I can offer for me is that my evangelism should be enabling people in context to hear Jesus say to them, come, follow me. The way in which this will be explained and expressed will vary in context. The extent to which it will need to be accompanied by explanation will vary in context. But at its heart, evangelism is not about people hearing us, but it's about them hearing Jesus. It is him who issues the call. Michael Green used a, an illustration that some people wouldn't like. He says, Jesus actually is our trump card. And as those of us who issue the call, we are not called to be judge. We are called to be witness. I agree with the missiologist Andrew Kirk that while there may be many forms of evangelism, actually the end does not justify the means. And our evangelism requires to be ethical and contextual. And my goodness, it requires to be loving or it bears no resemblance whatsoever to the young carpenter who walked along the shores of Galilee proclaiming the good news and saying, come, follow me. Everything else declares to be named a bad word, actually. Finally, I can do this quickly. I speak slow to allow you to come along. I think they need to be more human. Subtitle, to get a life. <laughs> to relax a little, really. Dan Kimball in his book, Why People Like Jesus But Not the Church, lists a number of reasons. The church is judgmental, negative, oppressive, and arrogant. Here's one of the comments. You don't have to agree with these people, but it's what they feel. They said this, you asked me why I don't go to church. Why would I want to become a negative person like most Christians? That's why I don't go. The world is negative enough without having the church make me feel worse. I saw what it did to someone very close to me, and I, I don't want to become like that. David Bosch perhaps puts it a bit more theologically when he says this, Evangelism is only possible when the community that evangelizes the church is a radiant manifestation of the Christian faith and exhibits an attractive lifestyle. Bosch asks how many of the millions of people in the world who are not confessing Jesus Christ have rejected him because of what they have seen in the lives of Christians. Thus, the call to conversion should begin with the repentance of those who do the calling, with those who issue the invitation. Now let me push hard. Normally when we talk about repentance, we talk about being more holy. I think we should repent because we need to be more human. Because holiness is revealed in humanity. Writing in 1998, Mike Riddell in his book, Threshold of the Future, which I think was one of the most provocative and finest books that have been written in mission, said the challenge of the next millennium lies in the humanization of the church. He continues his critique. The church is inhuman in the dual sense of being cut off from the humanity of its own members and being absent from the mass of humanity outside its door, doors. Both of these failings grow from an unconscious heresy, the denial of the full humanity of Christ. I think Riddell is on to something. I think he's on to something when I hear Christian people say that in times of trouble, 
they received most help from their non-Christian friends than they did from their Christian friends because their non-Christian friends didn't seem to be embarrassed that they were having trouble. I think he is on to something. When there's churches and congregations, we need programs and courses to teach us how to meet people. Really? And to find common ground with them. And, and, and Steve was talking about our need to do that the other day. The fact that we are having to say that itself is a problem. I talk to people every day. I think he is on to something. Because in the last two years, whenever I was invited to speak at events on mission, people liked what I said up until this point. So I, I feel that this is always worth pushing harder on. I don't know what you heard in your church at Christmas. But I'll tell you what I heard. I paraphrase. The Word became flesh and lived among us. We have seen His glory. The glory as of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. And we preached. He became one of us. I'm not sure we think that. In the 16th century, an Anabaptist writer, Pilgrim Marpeck, said this, Without the revelation of the Son, no creature in heaven or on earth can recognize the Father's work. For that reason, the Son assumed human nature to do human bodily works, speeding, speaking words and doing deeds. Thus, physical eyes could see him, physical ears hear him the physical body grasp and perceive him. According to the book of Hebrews, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in times of need. Such texts and theology should encourage us to take our own hu embodied humanity and that of others seriously as the place in which grace can be experienced. There, in the complexity and the humanity of life. Pilgrim Marpeck said the members of Christ's body, the people of God, in essence, are bodily creatures. This may be a surprise to you. Because they're flesh and blood and limbs. Without our creatureliness, we will not be saved in our creatureliness. We are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. We need to treat one another's humanity more seriously. And in turn, it should encourage us to sympathetically engage rather than disengage from the humanity of others. This engagement with the humanity of others should not be, to borrow from my colleague, Dr. Dorothy Hunts, it should not be an instrumental act to try and achieve some sort of a goal, but it should be an expressive act flowing from the recognition of our shared humanity. If the first Christians needed to be convinced of the divinity of Jesus to engage in evangelism, it may be that we contemporary Christians need to be reminded of his true humanity to engage in evangelism. A humanity of bodily presence among and a humanity of sympathy that deals grace in times of need. Riddell says, I don't think you'll like this. Perhaps the sign of the church's humanity will be when Christians can relax at parties and pray in pubs. Or when they can talk about their episodes of depression with a non-Christian workmate. Because if Jesus is making a difference in the journey of life, there is no need to hide anything. But what about sin? I hear people say. Sin is part of the complexity of humanity. Sin and our own sin, it does not live outside the walls of the church, but cuts through every human heart. Sin 
and the reality of sin is part of the complexity of human life, yet in this human life, we can find and experience grace and mercy. In fact, only there can we find and experience grace and mercy. When I was speaking, uh, I'm finished, more or less. When I was speaking in Europe the past couple of years, speaking about the humanity, people were really frustrated with me. And there was another thing that they get really frustrated with. I said, if you follow Jesus, he will lead you into bad company. <laughs> they didn't like this at all. I mean, don't blame me, it's in the text. He was actually the friend of sinners, you know. We still not got over that, have we? We stay distant. We stay afraid. Afraid of what? Afraid that you're going to be contaminated. Do you not believe that there is nowhere we can go? Where the presence of God cannot be experienced. Do we not believe that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that we've experienced? Maybe we don't. And if you don't, stay safe. And if you don't, stay apart. And if you don't, stay where you are. But don't talk about evangelism because you will not be part of it in the future. The options we do not have or the option we do not have is to carry on doing what we're doing. To carry on doing the same old stuff. The stuff is not working. And we now need to respond deeply. We need to think toughly, feel deeply, and act courageously. Thank you. I sit down? No. Okay. <laughs> we have much to think about, and we are thinking. Do you have some questions you'd like to ask? If you shout a lot at people, it usually quietens them down, I find. Very briefly, but this morning, Carolyn used the term white hot passion. Thank you for white hot passion tonight. Thank you. Not to have, not to have this corner dominate, but um, I was just, uh, I don't know if this is even on, but <laughs> oh, okay. Um, no, I just wanted to comment on uh, this morning, uh, Stephen. I, uh, oh, he can answer that. Uh, no, okay. no, uh, because it applies to something you just said. Uh, one of the points on Stephen's slide was uh, he actually had the words, learn to love. We have to learn to love. And it made me think of uh, um, Bill Hybels uh, just walk across the room or something like that or whatever. But I just wanted to just say that because... I think you hit you hit the same nails on the head there in a lot of part of your remarks. So I just wonder if you would even comment on that. Yeah, I, I was slightly surprised at the beginning tonight of the impact of a memory on me. Uh, which so I'm not able to talk about it still for some reason. Uh, and, and it's because I can see those kids, they were young. Uh, and they were young even then. It was a reach out to a very particular young subculture of clubbers. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know why that happens. But I, I do know there's been two experiences in my life where I, I guess I have experienced what people would say, somehow God breaks us for people. And that's not really my kind of talk. But th there have been experiences in my life where... God taught me to love. Yes. I, I, I mean, I, I say to people, I try to be 
peace loving. And the reason I try to be peace loving is I'm so not peaceable. It's just not, you know, this, we, should, we should try and pursue peace. I need to try and pursue peace because I'm not peace. That's not my, and I, and I don't think I'm naturally loving either, but there have been times in my life when, when somehow God has captured my heart for people. And that's a burden. Hmm. Uh, but I think it's a burden that we have to bear. And, and, I, and, and I don't, I'm, why am I struggling? I'm struggling because I don't want to turn it into, I don't want to trivialize it. I can't give you this as a strategy. This is not a strategy. God needs to do this. God, God. The other day I was struck by the fact that maybe on this campus, I don't know, maybe my imagination runs wild. Maybe on this campus, somebody wakened up the other day full of regret. Or maybe on this campus, someone's dreams for the future because of employment had come to nothing. Who cares? I don't know their families care, but who else cares? And what does it mean to speak gospel into that situation? Now, I'm aware of a situation more personally, a different subculture associated around some of my own family who faced a time of terrible loss and grief through the a violent suicide of a friend. And I thought, where, where is the person of God walks in that place and can live there with them? But to live there with them, you, you need to enter a, a subculture that is heavily tattooed, brilliantly creative, wickedly funny, and sometimes scandalous in their behavior. I, I think only God can give you that heart to live in that place. I, I just don't think it can offer it. And, and that's why we say you need to love more. I, I don't know how you would do that. I, I don't know how you make that a strategy. But as I say, I'm, I'm a bit nearly embarrassed. But I, I just remember those occasions. And so I think you're right. It comes back to an illustration. I don't know if it was a true one or not about the minister who stood up on three successive Sundays and only preached the three words. Uh, it was an anecdote I read, so I'm not sure. It's anecdotal. But his only words were love one another. And then he sat down. And people didn't really realize he wanted to basically go home. That was the sermon. It was over. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a nice illustration, but it, wasn't, it isn't just an illustration. Unfortunately, no. um, what you were talking about, all what we're doing in our little houses of worship uh, when we've got the whole week to deal with yeah, and what have you. So anyway, that's why I think it's bad to say that we have Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe others can speak better into this. I, yeah. Um. So I'm going to say that I think we just saw what it means to have our humanity shown and I really appreciate that. Um, and you're, you said that may be the hardest point that I heard you say that, except we need to find the gospel in our, and through our humanity. Mm. And that just lit up my own um, heart because um, that for me, I think has been missing in the institutional churches and in the world around us because there's too many, I hate to put the quotes around it, but there's too many Jesus answers so I appreciate that, and I think there's some horrific writers, Jean Vanier on Becoming Human. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, again, so there's, there's stuff out there, but maybe the question, and I, that's why I really appreciate your talk tonight, is that sense of all the, our history is coming with us, but in the time, getting in touch with our humanity and our humanness, my woundedness, my brokenness, my vulnerability, how, do we, how can we help build that into christians becoming more aware of their own humanity and then moving forward because i think that creates the space i don't know what your thoughts but how can we become more intentional about building that in to our lives so we become attuned to our own place just like you were tonight mm -hmm. it caught you off guard but i appreciate it because it's 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 here in the room with us mm -hmm. so I don't know if you care to respond to that. 
Yeah, I think that tonight for me, the, if I had to pick two things, in the middle, I think it's really important that we define what we're talking about when we're talking about evangelism, because I think the nub of the issue is at the point of intrusion and invitation into people's lives. But there are the, the, the two big themes for me, I think, were, were the first one. I, I'm absolutely fundamentally convinced in my being that the confession Jesus is Lord and that proclamation and trust that Jesus is alive is fundamental to the future of the church. Absolutely convinced. And on the other side, which may seem strange because that, to some senses, that's a, a story if you want. That, that, that's a story of divinity. If we want to do that, you know, he declared with power. Isn't it great? I love it. It's great. We should preach the resurrection every Sunday. I think Anna and I share a, yeah. And, and, and you know, he declared with power, there's the son of, who was the son of God? Who was this one that was declared with power? The man who was accused of being the friend of tax collectors and sinners. And I think that there's times in our protectiveness, we, re we retreat to the divinity not trusting that God can raise the dead, that can take this stuff of, of our humanity and, and it becomes a place where there's grace. How do we teach that? I, I, I think we need to talk more about the incarnation. I think we need to preach more for the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I think we need to say to people, let's imagine if Christian life looked like this. There's a young group in Croatia. Uh, some folk know Philip Cruz, I can't say his name, Grusic. Uh, folks like Jeff Carter, who some of you will know, has worked with him in Croatia. And he's a young guy I got to know. And he came along to both these things I was doing in uh, Vienna and in Norway. No, the one in Vienna he was at. And this kind of thing about, you know, go to and, and keep bad company. Folks, folks were, <laughs> yeah, people walked out. Uh, I was impressed I could still provoke that kind of reaction. <laughs> uh, he sent me, I, I asked him to, and he, he sent me a, a little story, which I, I didn't include tonight. He went back to his youth group, and they studied the Gospels. And then he, you, you see on the Facebook, the pictures, he says, well, now we go to the streets, we sing, we talk, we do all these things that we don't do in some senses because it might not be appropriate for our culture. He said, he said to me, I, I don't really think it's what you call keeping bad company. But he says, we have transformed who we are as a youth group. And every picture of them is out somewhere with somebody doing strange things with strange people. And I, so I think the gospel is actually, if we, if we take the mod, there's too much conceptual stuff about discipleship. Discipleship looks like what we read the disciples did when they were with Jesus. I'm not answering your question, I know, but I'm just saying things I forgot to put in. <laughs> you can pay me later. <laughs> Thank you. It's what people do when they answer questions. I'm just honest about it. But what's really, when you, say, when you talk about Jesus' disciples, which is, again, I just hit home, they doubted. They couldn't see Jesus in the midst when he was on earth. It took the resurrection for him to come back and then just the transformation. So when I talked about our humanity, our faith journey, it's too easy for, oh, I have Jesus on my side and then forget about our humanness. And that's, that's my worry about evangelizing in the world today. And I heard when you spoke about our humanity, that's why I was picking up on it. Yeah. That, that's the place where I think, we're called to grow in this day and age to be yeah. Jesus in the midst of the suffering. Yeah. And doing exactly what you said, declaring, but accepting our humanness. So there's times when I sit with people, I do not have the answer, but I know Jesus and the spirit is there. So that's why I was thinking uh, this question about in terms of your leadership um, in, in the role you have, and us collectively, how do we help bring that to 
people who are out there evangelism, understanding ourselves, our humanness in the midst of that. Yeah, yeah I, I do think that we do need to read the Gospels. Uh, and I do think we need to talk about it. And I do think we, we need to trust that God can take the stuff of dust and resurrect it into life. But we need to trust that. I think we avoid it. And in part, I understand concepts of holiness as separation. I understand that we need to make discernment and we need to make decisions. And just, I think, most of the decisions and the discernment we make seems to keep us away from people. And that, to me, is counter to the mission model of God. He became human. And we try and be safe. We make our choice. And, and oh, Frank. <laughs> it's okay, Frank, because I'll just say whatever I want anyway. I won't answer your question. Well, I need an answer. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, quite frankly, I'm, 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 I'm really struggling. Um, I, I came out of uh, a world where um, people preached the tenets of the gospel, reminded me of what it was to be a terrible sinner. And at some point, the Holy Spirit got a hold of people like me. And for goodness sakes, they actually invited me to become into relationship with Jesus. And surprisingly enough, it was attractive enough for, at least in my case, for me to come into relationship with Jesus. Um, you had these four things here. Uh, you know, we proclaim, we call, we announce. Bosch. Yeah. And then we invite. Uh -huh. uh, I, I see me understanding my humanity actually declaring it. You know, admitting it. You know, my sins are all over the floor. People can see them. And then I tell them that Jesus came along and helped me to sweep them up. And he can do the same for them. Um, so I invite that, that interaction with humanity. At what point, for goodness sakes, do we ever get to the place where we actually invite somebody that come into relationship with Jesus, and how do we do it in the midst of giving them a, a coat at the clothing bank or giving them a hot dog with mustard on it at the, at the food depot, um, instead of walking away being satisfied that we have clothed them and fed them, but they've never been invited into a classic relationship with Jesus. I need to know how to do that at the food bank and at the at the cloth bank, because for some reason, I don't believe I'm singing the song, oh, if I just eat a hot dog, everything will be okay. I can't answer your question because I'm not there. In fact, I think it's the wrong question. And it's maybe... Yeah, I'm thinking out loud, yeah? I'm verbal processing now, <laughs> which is the way in which you are allowed to speak a lot of rubbish and deny it was important later. I fundamentally agree with you at the heart of evangelism is more than connecting with people. The event I told you about, Bob's Dance Cafe, made no pretense to be evangelistic. We had no right to evangelize that subgroup of people until we'd learned to love them, until we'd spent time with them, in my opinion. And that's all it was. Some of them we met in other times and in different places. And, and these were different contexts in which word perhaps could be spoken. When do we invite? I think we go back to, I, I want to resist. We should always invite. And I think we need to invite the discernment of the moment. I, I don't know any other way to answer that. I mean, we maybe need to ask, 
I know people say that they, they pray to God and God leads them and they told me to do it then and there. I have, if I'm waiting on all these experiences, there won't be much inviting. Uh, but I think it, it can only be in context. That's why I'm hesitant. I mean, do, if you want me to say, do I think there has to be a point? Yes, I think evangelism involves fundamentally at the point allowing people to hear the call of Jesus, come follow me. Fundamentally, yes, I agree. And I think that for a person to come and follow Jesus, by definition, requires repentance in the biblical sense of a turnaround in their life. And I think that inwardly they will experience all these things that we talk about, the forgiveness of sins, etc. I just don't think all of that needs to be in an evangelistic talk. Sometimes it might have to be depending upon the context. So on the one hand, I would agree with you absolutely. I think there is an invite. And that invite may or may not create a crisis. And that invite may or may not harm the relationship. But when we actually do it, I don't know because I think it depends on the moment. It depends on trust. It depends on the relationship. It depends on honesty. In that kind of context, because that's not the only form. Evangelism can take many forms. So I go back to the baptismal service in the context of worship. In a baptismal service, I wouldn't blink. I would, I would, yeah, come forward. I have no problem with that in that context. In a context of someone I don't know very well, but I meet down the street, it's a different context. Everything's different. And there, I need a different form of discernment and might need a different language. So, can't answer it. Uh, over here, and then Anne at the back. I was going to say, let's go for, I think, presume we have some online questions there. So. Yeah, I'm not sure this might, oh, it's working, good. Yep. Um, there's been a really interesting uh, discussion going on on the Zoom um, at the moment, and I'll try and formulate it into uh, a question. And it's, uh, I think, in response to what you're saying, Stuart, about, um, you know, being incarnational and being human, and yet as leaders, sometimes we get in the way of what God wants to do. Maybe Jesus wants to say to people, come follow me, but we, in our humanity, kind of get in the way and they're looking to follow us rather than Jesus. Or um, how do we, how do we be, remain embodied, real human, and yet still allow Jesus to speak? And I think it links with, I think it links with something that you were just saying about how do we hear, how do we discern yeah. in the context? I don't know how any individual hears or discerns. And I think there's something, I, I, I know that your question's reflecting. I think where the problem lies is precisely in the idea that our humanity gets in the way. Now we might, if something gets in the way, I think it's maybe our sinfulness that gets in the way. But I, I think it's that very issue in there there's something about us that can't relax ourself with being followers of Jesus. It's, and therefore, I'm, I'm not sure the best way to answer it without creating a, an understanding of humanity that is different from the one I'm trying to press towards. I think we need to come at, at ease with our own humanity. And the more we come at ease with who we are, the more we come at ease with the fact that, that we are followers of Jesus, the more that we come at ease that we can be followers of Jesus and sit anywhere with anyone in any place and love them, the more I think we become at ease, then I think the less our humanity come in the way. I think the problem is not our humanity getting in the way. I think we're not human enough. I know that's a strange argument. I'm, I'm just worried that we, that, that we fall back on the, well, it's because I'm human, I didn't do it. Well, let's explore what it means to be human. There's something wrong in our understanding. Or there, there, there's a need for us to develop what it means to be fully human people. I mean, the, 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 the book by uh, Frost, Michael Frost, a uh, excarnation, that's not the name of the book. The title has gone out. He, he makes a big emphasis on this, and I think it's very helpful in terms of uh, trying to express some of what it means for us to be human. So 
I'm a little reluctant to try and answer the questions on terms of the way in which our humanity gets in the way. Because... Can I add something of yep. my own in there? Oh, please. Yeah, because if you can I answer think, it, I think this it. is the kind of conversation we need to be having, right? Because we're figuring yep. it out. Yeah. Um, and it, it, this is more from experience. Like, I'm sure I could back it up theologically if you gave me a few minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> doesn't usually take that long. Theologian can justify anything. Okay. Uh, yes, and thank you for that. <laughs> um, it seems to me that if we're embodying the gospel contextually, which is what, this is what we're talking about, right? You embody the gospel contextually. Jesus can't then help but speak. I, I wonder if we have um, disembodied our, our listening to the Holy Spirit so that it becomes this yeah. kind of pious, you know, I'm in the spirit. And, you know, that kind of language yeah. is what you hear rather than, wow, when I've, I've found when you're, you're just going about stuff, and God taps you on the shoulder and says, whoa, hey, look. And, you're, you know, you're almost caught off guard rather than this kind of, well, if I just meditate long enough and I listen to God long enough, I won't actually have to listen to the people around me. I'll always just hear mm -hmm. God's voice. But it seems to me that it's much more when we're embodying those opportunities, the gospel's there, we're confident in him and his ability, and then, then we hear. But, I mean, can you comment on the role of the Holy Spirit in this? Yeah, I I mean, the only way I can experience the Holy Spirit, I'd say, I, I think we're embodied human beings. And, and again, I, I know we, different people split us into, you know, we can be body, soul, and spirit, or we can be body, spirit, body, soul. Actually, whatever way we divide that up, here it is. <laughs> and my life is experienced embodied and, and i think we do need to press into and so my experience of the holy spirit is, is in and through who i am as 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 a person because because i'm a creature that's the stuff that god was placed to deal with and I, therefore i like what you're suggesting in the sense that we need, i think we need to understand better that this sense of of the spirit with us in our humanity and not simply over here or in the good bits or in the meditative bits but just with us indeed even still with us in some of our worst moments more maybe even well yeah I, and and i think if we can embrace that a little bit and that's why I, I, and i know you know why i'm just we're, we're talking here uh, to make sense of it, that, but that is why I'm reluctant. The first option is our humanity gets in the way. I think our humanity should be where it happens, because it is where it happens. It's you, wherever you are at that time, with all of that stuff that's going on. And then, yet yeah, we need to be free from the disembodied spirit of spirituality. I, we, we need some of this in our our very being. I think. But it's another area I think, yeah, I'm, this is only the beginning of the conversation. I was told I'm just provoking some of the conversation, but I think these are, there's someone over there. I hope you're not going to quote me back to me. I don't like that. Not at all. Okay. <laughs> well, you said, no, I'm kidding. Um, so should I stand? All right, I'll stand. <laughs> Uh, Stuart, I, I come from the uh, wonderful city of Toronto, which is uh, like one of the most, if not the most multicultural city in the world. Uh, all sorts of cultures, all sorts of beliefs and different. Um, and so my question is, um, I've met street preachers on the corner of Young and Dundas uh, who will claim to say that uh, they're doing God's work, that they're proclaiming uh, the gospel to, you know, the 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 last, the lost, the least. Um, and I, I was just wondering, uh, what would you, uh, after tonight's talk, what would you say to them? Um, you know, they would pe there are people that would say that they're, they know what they're called to. They're, you know, they're speaking out of love uh, for the, you know, the masses of mankind. Um, and yet so many people are turned off to what they have to say. Or I guess more accurately, it would be their approach yeah. to how they would say it so like 
at what point do we as as Christian believers um, and people, pastors who are committed to uh, you know, putting forth the gospel, at what point do we uh, encourage their so-called ministry, stand up for their courage for standing on a street corner and you know shamelessly pro- uh, proclaiming the gospel? Uh, and then at what point do we sort of you know, maybe disassociate ourselves with them because what they have to say doesn't necessarily convey Christ's love. Thank you. Did someone put you up to this quest? <laughs> the, the reason I'm going to... Do you know what my PhD research was in? Did you know what my PhD research was in? Street preaching. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, well, yeah, I'd, I'll give you a copy if you want to read it, yeah. I think I would say a couple of things. There is some terrible preaching in church. <laughs> it's not all out there that it's bad. There's some unloving preaching in church. There's unloving preaching outside. There is uh, all of that. So some of the same problems exact exist in both places. Do you know... I think we need to defend the right to be there, even although we disagree with the way in which we present the gospel. And I think we need to do it because we are not there sometimes. So I, I think there's a number of layers of this. Uh, the wonderful thing, of course, about street preaching is it's very democratic. And if you want to have a, a go back, that would make it a performance. So I think there's a number of options. We can either say, okay, this is so not what we do. We can say, as has certainly been true historically and still to the present day, sometimes people who preach in the street appear to have contact with people who otherwise would not be hearing the gospel in any other way. That seems to be the evidence. So we can say, well, maybe it's a good thing. We could say it's awful. We can name it in a whole variety of ways. We could contest it on the street. So I think it's, it's, it's complex in terms of what it is as an event. Yeah, maybe contest it. That would be fun. Uh, or we ignore it. And it'll either come to something or come to nothing. But and, and some, someone has written a really interesting piece uh, which makes the point that in a day and an age where increasingly Christians feel as though they're losing the public voice. Performing publicly in the street may be one of the places where, again, they can contest the powers. So there's another story in it as well. I think it's a good question because many of them, I, you, you want to fight them. Well, I do. Uh, uh, because you just think this is terrible and it's putting people off and it's doing all of these things. I asked some people in Glasgow about, I couldn't include it in my research because I I didn't, didn't have the right permission to do what I ended up doing that day, but I was interested. So I just asked people going by, what do you think of this? Uh, and and the, the kind of very anecdotal responses I got, some folks said, well, it's terrible. Other people said they've got the right to do it. Other people said we can walk back by them. I was surprised, actually. There wasn't nearly as much upset over it as I felt about it. And maybe that helps us a little but if they're, but in the day they become absent, who's present publicly in our street? So, and, and I say that as someone who laughs when I, I see there's a, a terrible YouTube video of a, a slightly inebriated man in Glasgow contesting the street preacher. Uh, yeah, and we, we all thought it was great when he did. I see that as some of that view. So I think there's a whole number of things, layers going on in there. Uh, But I would also say, again, there's a lot of bad preaching takes place in church that is as offensive sometimes as as the street preaching. We can talk more. I think as we continue tonight, there are more and more questions bubbling through. I've seen two more hands, but I think those are the last two that we'll go with. Thank you for talking about Hebrews. That's great. <laughs> um, 
I've heard it said tonight, and we talk about it in the church, we need to love people more. Uh, I find it interesting that we are born loving people and something happens. I wonder if we shouldn't learn to love people, but rather we should stop teaching why we shouldn't love people in the name of Christ. Yeah, I, I think some of our teaching gives the impression of separation. And sometimes we name some people as sinners. Hello? We're all sinners. So let's acknowledge that. The wonder of the grace of God is that we're sinful people who he saves, not good people. But we develop an idea of fundamentally our own righteousness in which we build a separation from others. And to me, that is actually a denial of the grace that we claim that we have. And I think that is where part of the struggle. I understand why we do it, because we want to... I, I actually think an ethical life is important. I think there is behavior. I think there's a way you live. I think all of these things. But maybe, and I'm fortunate because I was brought up with, you know, my mother taught me to be a decent, law-abiding person on the whole. Coming to Jesus really messed up my life. Uh, it, it made me a bit more wild, I think. Uh, but, but I think we need to remember our sin, which is not about excusing our sin, but having sympathy with one another in our sinfulness. I, I think is sometimes necessary, unless we are going to start listening and saying we're better and other people aren't. I think it's that that we fall into. We want to be faithful followers of Jesus, but sometimes in the way we teach doing that, it it leads to a a, a view of holiness that is separation. Riddell says holiness is portable. I like that. that. We don't have to see that's what is at risk. And in fact, so, yeah. Well, there was someone down here had their hand up for a while before others. Okay. So I, I, well, you've given up and I'm defending you. (laughs) But, but, but but if it is a difficult question. Well, it is. That's why I've done it. Oh. You said you didn't want to be quoted back to you. Yeah, okay. Come (laughs) on. So that's what I'm going to do. That's okay. (laughs) Uh, earlier, you, you, earlier you said um, you could hardly believe, I think more or less, that you could hardly believe that we need to teach people how to talk to one another. And I kept thinking back to Frank's question because the answer is kind of, we have to teach people how to talk to one another. And I guess that's almost what I'm hearing tonight. I mean, you, you've communicated that very well, is that we are poor at listening. We're poor at relating, and we need to do that better somehow. And so I guess for us to be better communicators, we need to learn how to be better listeners and better absorbers and better contextualizers and better recognizers of whatever context we're in. And so that sounds like that's hard. Mm. Doesn't sound easy, and, and anyway, I just, I just I wanted to have that chance to quote you back to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I, I think it's true in one level. I think at the point of the invitation, it becomes hard. I think that's where we, we struggle. Uh, I think at other points, I, I just don't think we should be saying to people, do some kind thing for your neighbor because it's a way of connecting with them that you can, so you can witness to them. Man, even if I wasn't a Christian, I would clear the snow off my neighbor's grass because you're a person. And, and sometimes we seem less that than, than others. And it's more that I'm pressing at. And, and, and the fact that, and I know not everyone's like that. There are cruel people, there are bad people, there are hard people, there are miserable people. On the whole, that's not my most experience in life, although it happens. I just think there's a deep humanity we sometimes avoid. Uh, and, and I'm actually very shy in one one relation. I know it's strange. It's that strange mixture of personality. Put me up here and I, I, you know, I kind of feel I've been let out of a cage. Uh, and, and if I find it 
I can find it awkward and, and hard, but I, I just realize moving about, I, I find folk funny. I, I'm finding them entertaining. I find they bring me joy more and more. I think if we can embrace that and in that and, and maintain that, that it goes back to, I mean, the question Anna put and Frank has put is right. We need to learn in that to give the invitation, not apart from that, not other than that, but in that. And, and that's where I think we need to press. I agree that we, we need to work on, because I think that's at the heart of where we find our difficulty. Last question. You're going to quote me back? Thank you. No, no. Okay. I'll probably tell a few stories, though. OK. Uh, first of all, I want to, he doesn't know this, but I, I want, will you stand up, Keith? I want to honor this man. He, and I, I want to say with sincerity uh, that none of your critiques apply to this man. This oh, well, man of God, good. I lived with him for two years. And uh, he, he's <laughs> quite a character. He's fully human, that's for sure. Um, he, is an, he is an incredible world-changing youth minister and he's going to be leaving this region in a couple of weeks and he's done more to connect with the community that his congregation has is seated in than oh, that is a good test i got. can imagine it's yeah. an incredible testimony and and he's done so much to connect my heart with youth and young people um so there's there are people doing it right yeah um Second, well, there's a few things. Can he sit down? He can sit down. He can sit down. Yeah. Uh, my name's Zach, by the way. Anyway, uh, I was once at the Divinity College, and now I'm a history major. I went the other way. Yeah. Um, I'm becoming more human. Yeah. Hey! <laughs> I think you've had enough time. <laughs> so, I, I'm not engaged with the current literature so much but what i have been invested in is some deep research into the state of the baptist church of exactly 100 years ago mm -hmm. i'm studying the chaplaincy the world war one baptist chaplains from the maritime baptist convention i've been studying that for nearly a year now but and i found some very interesting things that in the convention, on the outbreak of war, the editor of the Maritime Baptist, the denominational newspaper, John Howard MacDonald, he said something very interesting. He said, there's no fundamental antagonism between the individual and the social gospel. A hundred years later, I believe we're still dealing with the after effects of the split. Even after the war, in 1919, when thousands of, of young people were killed and returning maimed, they still had the conviction in 1919 to say, we are in the process of establishing Christ's kingdom here on earth. Could we survive another war? Now, that's not my question, but my question, well, my question is, What kind of, like, esch I can't see evangelism aside from eschatology. I can't see saying we need to get ready for the next world without having an understanding of what the future and purpose of this world is. I, and I see the most attractive type of evangelism happening is, is around the theology of the gospel of the kingdom, which used to be called the social gospel, but then that became a bad word. So I guess if you could comment on the kingdom of God and how, and how eschatology, like what's the purpose of this? Are we, is it just going to burn away? Are we, or is this just a rescue mission to get people to heaven? Or is it something to do with answering the Lord's prayer on earth as in heaven? So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> the, there, there was, there was a very brief paragraph from what I said, uh, in terms where, if put the notes over there, and I depend upon them much more than you might think. 
But I said something along the lines of this. I said, I, I don't think the discussion about the separation between evangelism, the pursuit of social justice, and social concern takes us anywhere. To put that differently, to me, these are three integral parts of mission. And that was where, in a sense, I was throwing something out towards the, the discussion that you are mentioning. Uh, creation of a new heavens and a new earth. I, I think the arc of the universe bends towards justice and we work towards that in this world now. What will that look like finally? I don't know. But do I think of that all that is built and is worthwhile uh, comes to dust? No. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken, but stuff will stand and last and live and count. And the cup of water will matter. So, and I think I, I wanted to push harder into focusing on that verbal personal, mainly because that was a, the named part of what we were doing. But I would see it as absolutely integral. And, and in that call, when Jesus says to someone or to me, come follow me, I have rolled up in that everything. The kingdom of God is near, all that stuff is rolled up in what there became my shorthand. So I'm not sure you and I would disagree very much, to be honest, uh, in terms of how I understand that. But I do remember in one context, it was the context of apartheid South Africa, my, my good friend, late friend, David, who was a huge campaigner for human rights and issues of equality and went back into Australia and, and, and also in defense and the rights of indigenous people. I remember asking him while apartheid was still going on, I said, what's the solution? They said that some people would come to know Jesus. His answer surprised me because I didn't think that's what he would say. And so at the heart of the transformation of our world, I think there is still the transformation of people's hearts. When Jesus captures them and years later they waken up and say, after it all, the ups and the downs, the love affair and the hate with the church, the good and the bad, the sad, the anger, the lamentation and the praise, and you waken up and you say, still I will follow. To me, it rests at the heart of the transformation of all things, I, if I have to name it. But for me, that's not separate from the other issues that you've spoken about. Okay. Thank you. Thank everyone. I'll just say, um, I guess from my point of view, this has just been a rich evening. That would be the word that I would use. That we are thinking deeply about evangelism. And as professor of evangelism and mission, nothing could make me much happier than that. Um, and what I'm hoping is that you will keep thinking about these things. That uh, you will consider the things we've talked about tonight and this week. Uh, because uh, I think that uh, these are of great, great importance for us and for the church. Thank you for being part of Simpson Lectures this year. And I'd like to just close our time in prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, the one who is holy, the one who is good, God of grace and love and mercy, we thank you for a time like tonight when we can seek after you, we can, when we can express our hunger and our thirst. with confidence in your ability to fill us, to meet our needs. And we hunger and thirst not only as individuals, but as, but as churches, as your church. With confidence in you. And so as we leave this place, 
May we continue to seek after you. May we allow your spirit to fill us, that we would be transformed in the ways that we see the people around us, that we might see as you see, that we might love as you love. Guide us, bless us, bless our churches, we pray in Jesus' name.